Huh? Yeah, we, yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Oh, okay. All right. We have a series of questions, and they're going to be kind of intimate, so we're going to have to... Uh, yes, the questions the we'll dog. be asking you is... um. Very deep and personal. Well, to begin with, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. <laughs> I had no hand in it. I was somewhere else at the time. But I'm here now. All right. Pass me a piece of and, paper. Um, and, uh... That's Isaac. Let me know when it's done. All right. You're going to be telling us things that you've never told anybody before. Treat this interview like it was your last, last interview. What do you want everybody to remember? Well, not even remember. To know. Well, you know, what, 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 that you haven't... let me tell you something. I lived 80, 80 years, you know, and uh, it's a question of where do you want me to start? You want me to start with the day I was born or the next day? Your first oh, memory. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hold on. The first... we'll, get, we'll get to the questions. We, we'll, be, we'll do the questions. Oh, in other words, I'm going to answer. We'll be asking, you'll be answering. Okay. I'll, I'll be brief, though. Okay? No, you got to. I'll answer. The whole point is not to be brief. Excuse me? Just tell the truth. That's all you got to do. Truth. That's all. The truth tell the, I'll set you free. Just the truth, folks. That's all. Eh? Just the facts, what man. Was your, all right. Hold on. Complete silence. Oh, you got him down. What was your first memory as a child? My first memory as a child? What was your f oldest okay. memory of anything? Very. Uh, that's an interesting question. Like in park My first swing. memory as a child. I was a foster child living with in a foster home, and my mother coming one day on a Sunday to visit me in this foster home, and she brought me a pair of new sneakers. And uh, I recall that. Uh, I couldn't have been more than possibly uh, six years old at the time, maybe seven. But that's my first recollection. Excuse me, I can't talk well because I had dental work done yeah. and I can't get used to the, the, the new teeth. <clears throat> All right. So uh, if I spit the stammer and sputter, you know why. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Okay. What memory do you have of your father, if you have any at all? I have no memory of my father because when my father passed away, I was uh, about three years old. And how did that happen again? I remember I from the building. And well, the as I understand it, as, a, as it was told to me, uh, my father had an opportunity to go into a new business with a partner. And uh, he went to the bank to take out his share of the money to go into this new partnership. And those days, you know, they didn't deal with checks. It was cash, you know. Mm -hmm. So he went to the bank and they withdrew a sum of money. I don't know what how much it was, but it was a sizable sum. And he, uh, while at the bank, there were two thugs hanging around. And they saw him withdraw this money. They followed him home. And this was... Uh, it was late in the afternoon, it was late in the afternoon, and uh, the thugs they got him in the hallway, hit him over the head, knocked him unconscious, stole his money, and he's left them there. And it wasn't until the next morning when my mother found him laying in the hallway, and he was dead at the time. They literally killed him. They stole the money and killed him. And at the time, I was like three years old, so I, I, I didn't know from anything. What was um, what year was that? Name? What year was that? Yes. Well, let's see. It had to be 77 years ago if I'm going to be 80 years old. And it happened when I was three, so it must have been 77 years ago. Yeah, we'll that is, uh, that. Yeah, we'll figure that. Yeah. You, what was um, the name of your parents, your, your mom and your father? What were their names? Well, my your mother's name was Mary. My father's name was Jacob, so you have his name, mm -hmm. Jacob, and uh, that answers your question. Yeah. Right? So your mother raised you? Well, yes. Well, what happened was, you know, 
at the time my father was killed, there were three children. I was the baby. Mm-hmm. My, bro- my brother, Name. who was like three and a half years older than me, and my sister, who was four and a half years older than me, so they were all older. And they remember him to some extent, but I, of course, don't remember him. So my mother was, my mother had like three children. There were three children. And, uh... What were their names? Excuse me? What were their names? Oh, my sister's name was Lena. I don't think I ever met her. Lena, L-E-N-A, Lena. I never even knew you had a sister. Yeah, I didn't know you had a sister. Oh, yeah, she lives on the West Coast, in Flint, in California. Oh, I know. You didn't know that? No, I knew, I knew about Dave. Well, your father tells you nothing, huh? No, not really. Do you, ever, do you ever question your father about it? I see. Yeah, but he don't really remember nothing. Well, anyway, she lives on the West Coast uh, in uh, California. And uh, the last time I saw her was at uh, Uncle Dave's 80th birthday. She came in from California I met her. to Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And we all met in Phoenix, Arizona. And that was the first time, I had, not the first time, that was the first time in a long time mm-hmm. that I saw her again. And uh, I forgot your question. What's your question? Oh, no, I the name, all right. Names, yeah. My brother's name was Dave, mm-hmm. and my sister's name was Lena. Right. But she liked to be called Dixie. Dixie? Yeah. She hated the name Lena. Lena. <laughs> so she liked to be called Dixie. <laughs> hmm. All right, any other, any other questions? Yes, yes. When did your family come to this country? Like, what, what generation? Did your mother come? All right, that's a good question. My mother came to this country when she was like 19 years old. She bought a boat on her own, not having a living soul in, in, in America. And uh, she came on her own. And it took an awful lot of guts to do that in those yeah. days. Coming to a foreign land, knowing nobody, Name the language? Excuse me? Not even the language? And not being familiar with the language. All she spoke was Yiddish and Russian, because she came from Russia. Well, over here, went, so uh, I, don't, I don't want to get into the area where uh, she met my father here in America, mm-hmm. here in this country, and they met, they kept company, and then they got married. And as a result, there was three children involved. Uh, but she had hard times, hard, she had a lot of hard times. When she first came to this country, she got herself a job as a cook. She worked it for a family. And I'll tell you a very interesting story which, that she told me, that I recall. She used to get a day off, obviously, so she didn't know what to do with the day off. She got paid, she got the day off. And she went out and she went into a restaurant. She went into a restaurant and she ordered a meal. It was a sumptuous meal, you know, from soup to nuts. And uh, uh, it was like seven, eight different courses to the meal. So finally the check came. (laughs) The check came to 17 cents. (laughs) (laughs) So my mother says, 17 cents? So the waiter had to explain, he said, well, after all, he says, you had the soup, and you had the four spice, and you had the entree, and you had dessert. So he's trying to qualify why it costs that much money, <laughs> which I thought was very, very funny at the time. <laughs> well, 17 cents at that time was a lot, right? Well, 17 cents was, uh, was a lot of money in those days, you know. Why? Yeah? It cost 100 cents, you know, right, for that? Yeah, probably. So uh, I thought that was very interesting, don't you? Mm-hmm. Good story. Yeah. What do you remember as an adolescence, like around 15, 14? Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. So, um, yeah, I want to know, no, no, yeah, how was school? What schools? What schools I went yeah, to? Yeah, what was your... Tell school. Yeah, that's what I was like. You that's spoke Yiddish, right, right, at first, when you first got to school. That's all you spoke, right? Oh, well, the first language I learned, actually, was Yiddish. So you know Yiddish? Well, I spoke to Yiddish when I was like three years old. That was, that was I the first language. Do you still remember it? I, well, actually, I remember more of what I picked up in the late, later years as opposed to what I learned uh, as a child, as a baby. 
But, uh, oh, I, I can understand a lot of Yiddish now. I don't speak it that well, but I can understand a lot of it. So, school, what happened? School, all right. School Popular, days. a nerd, a loser? The school days. The school days. What do you remember? Well, I'll tell you quite frankly, you know, uh, my school days consisted of the fact, well, consisted mainly when I was a foster child, I, I went to school. And being a foster child, I went from one family to another family because uh, in those days, they didn't let foster children remain with one family too long because they didn't want the foster parents to become uh, attached, be, to become that involved with the child, or the child to become that involved with the foster parent. So I was shifted around from one to another. As a result of that, uh, going from one school to another school, in, in the middle of the terms, I uh, was held back a year because of that. Uh, as far as my, what do you ask me as far as that, nerd? A nerd, smart, dumb, like popular, tough, bully? No, actually I was uh, quite withdrawn. I kept to myself mostly. And uh, I didn't get involved that much with other kids. Except when I, at, at a later time, when I uh, went to live with my mother. Uh, which was, uh, was about 11, 11 and a half years old when I went to live with my mother. Because at that time she was able to take care of not only me, but my brother and my sister as well. So we all lived together in this one apartment. So uh, when I did live on the east side at that time, I met a lot of kids my own age and I picked up a lot of friends there. But uh, oddly enough, it turned out to be I was considered an oddball because of my background. These other kids were born and brought up on the Lower East Side. Americans. And they were very street smart. I was not that street smart because I didn't hang, mm -hmm. hang out in the streets the way they did. But uh, as, a, as a result of that, uh, well, I picked up and I got with it, you know, and I more or fit in with the rest of the guys. Who were they, who were they like, like? The guys that, that my was friends? How old the day, yeah, like, how old was hanging out with them? How old were the guys? No, like, how, what, we guys, what would you do on an old day basis hanging out with Well, quite guys? frankly, in those days, there wasn't a hell of a lot to do. So what you did was, like, hang around, a, hang out on a corner. And uh, our favorite spot to hang out, there was a... Uh, First of all, it started out as a candy stand. You know what a stand is? It's not located in a any particular structure. It's it on the sidewalk. A, it was built on the outside mm -hmm. of the structure. And uh, uh, so it was a candy stand. And we used to always hang out on the corner. And there wasn't a hell of a lot to do except we would play games, like kick the can. You familiar with that game? Yeah, yeah, no, kick the really. can. Not... Well, it's like kick the can. It's a game where you have the can and you kick the can and run bases, you know. You play marbles? Played marbles. Stick ball? Oh, we used to call them Emmys. Emmys? Emmys. <laughs> Emmys. And uh, played Ringo Levio. Did you ever hear that game? No, we jump on each other's back, so. Huh? Can we jump on each other's backs? Johnny on a Pony? Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you hear that game? I played that before. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. We played at school sometimes. So we played all those games. Kick the Can, the uh, Ring Alivio, and Stickball was very big. That was before TV when you actually did things. Oh, well, TV was it, Not only was I invented then, it was way before TV. As a matter of fact, in them days, a radio was a big deal. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I didn't have a radio in my house. We had two kids who had radios in their house. That was a big deal. We used to go up their house. We used to listen to programs, The Witch's Tale, which is a very popular program, like a spooky type of program. Mm -hmm. We started off with a creaking door, you know, mm -hmm. and the voice.
voice like saying, this is the witch's tail. Oh, the kids used to shut up. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that, that's what we did in those days. So there was very little radio that we watched because we didn't have any. But later on, we did get a radio. And uh, But in those days, you didn't hang around the house too much because we lived on the Lower East Side. In a five-story tenement house. What uh? What corner did you hang on? Do you remember the street number? Oh sure, we used to hang out on uh, Henry uh, Corner Montgomery, Henry Street Corner Montgomery. Are you familiar with that? Uh, well, we're gonna check it out. We'll we'll check, check it out. out? Yeah. Check it out. See what it is. Yeah. On the corner. And, Play with uh, Lydia. Yeah, keep it can. So that's where we hung out. And later on, this uh, candy stand that we I just spoke of. Mr. Shapiro, who owned this candy stand, he leased a corner store that he opened up a candy store. And then we really had a good hangout. <laughs> so he used to chase us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he chased after all. How many kids can he uh, get hang around, the, hang around the store? He had other customers he had to take care of. And we were a pain in the ass to him as far as that's concerned. <laughs> but uh, he tolerated us pretty well. But on an opposite corner, there was a drugstore, and the, uh, the, his name was uh, Menica, Mr. Menica. And every time we'd come near the store, he'd chase us. <laughs> and especially when we play stickball, it was like uh, right outside the store, we used to play stickball. And he used to come out and rant and rave, hey, get out of here, you kids, you're going to break the windows. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. But later on, you know, as we got a little older, as we got a little older, we started, uh, which was the custom in those days, for young young fellows like ourselves to uh, have a cellar club. Do you ever hear these cellar clubs? Mm, I think so. Um, I was watching the Bronx sale today. Yeah. They had a, their own club, uh, the kids. Was named C and all his friends had the aces a while. That's like, really not the point, but it just. All right. it, <laughs> well, anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> like a social they, club. They were about. It was a social club, yeah. Right, that's what it was called, yeah. Right, so, uh, Bronx Tale. We got together, we got together, and uh, we chipped in a quarter apiece. There were 30 of us. Wow. We chipped in a quarter apiece. And that gave us our first month's rent. And we, we scrounged the neighborhood for furniture to put down in the cellar club. And we had the storefront where you could go down about four steps into the basement, into the basement. And there we started our uh, cellar club. And it was called the SACOS, S-A-C-O-E-S, Social Athletic Club of the East Side. That's what SACO stands for. And quite frankly, those times, <clears throat> excuse me, those were the greatest times I remember. Yeah? In the club, as a young man, where we used to uh, have socials on Friday nights and Sunday nights and invite girls down, girls our own age. You come down How old were you around the time now? Oh, about 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. 17. So you were in high school? Yeah, yeah, we were in high school at the time. And we used to have the dances on for socials on Fridays and Sundays. And, uh, of course, uh, being uh, having our own place, we had where to hang out, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like today where your kids have their uh, uh, dens uh, to bring their friends or living rooms or basements, uh, finished basements. Mm -hmm. In those days, we, you know, we had nothing like that. We, we lived in a railroad flat, mm -hmm. you know, and there was no uh, no place of social ice in the, the railroad flat. So this club was a godsend to us. You remember, had, um, do you remember your first girlfriend? Remember the name of your first girlfriend? Oh, well, I had several girlfriends, you know. You well, well, how old were you when you first had your first one? Your first kiss. First kiss, first girl. Year. Quite frankly, you know, to me, those are trivialities, you know. Those things are important. 
No, so. they are. You know, that's where reality is. So. Uh, you know, yeah, there were flirtations here and there, you know. When you, well, who's your first real the first long period of time girl? Oh, let's say I went with a girl named Edie. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we see her not, uh, I saw her not too long ago. Mm. And this was like uh, 60 so. No, I mean, with uh, with uh, my wife. Uh -huh. We were invited to the house. All right, all right. You know, we were invited to the house. Oh, yeah? Yeah, wow. sure. That was and, interesting. Uh, Take her behind the bathroom, please. Into the bathroom. <laughs> With the sink. Okay, and she, she boasts, as a matter of fact, she boasted to her kids. She spoke to her kids over the phone. She says, I have any Deutsch here, and he was my first boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's an impression. Eddie. 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 So all your friends call you Eddie, right? Not Edward? Yeah, Eddie. No, always Eddie. All right. Always Eddie. How old were you when you joined the services? Oh, well, when I first well, was the girls' part. Yeah, hey, like you said before, like, you know, it's right. not that important. All right. Girls well, come, girls go. Yeah, that's right. How yeah. old are you when you first, uh... <laughs> <laughs> huh? First of all, you're too young for me to tell it. And certainly he's too young <laughs> for him to hear it. No, right? just come on. What do you mean, come on? You're not talking to me. All right, let me, all right. You want to know something about it? Look at the camera and tell us. All right. No, he's talking to us. He's not talking so to the camera. Getting back to the club, okay? So one, one guy in the club, he had a... He was the big shot in the club, all right? He, he had a job where he was making 20 bucks a week. Oh, that's He worked for Park and Tilford. That's a, uh, they, was a, they were a whiskey house. And he was a bookkeeper. And he was making 20 bucks a week, which was a lot of money. Because the average guy working that we know of was making like 12 bucks a week. So he had a car. He owned a car. So this was great. He, we had a guy at the club who owned a car. His name was Tiny Marcus. And he had a Hudson. Do we have a Hudson car? No, no. We'll look it up, though. Yeah. <laughs> look it up. He had a Hudson. Anyway, so one day we all pile in a car. Say, what do you say, Tiny? We'll all go up to Harlem and get laid. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's <laughs> no, wait a minute. I'm telling you this because it's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> we pile in a car, there's five or six of us. I don't remember exactly. So we got like five, six guys in a car, and we're going up to Harlem. We get up to Harlem, and we stop for a red light. We're like on 125th Street in Harlem, and uh, we're stopping for this light. And uh, a colored, a black girl sees us in the car. Five white guys, you know. We can only be there for one reason. You know, they don't. <laughs> we we can only be there for one reason. It was a black neighborhood even then, Harlem. Yeah, Harlem was black. Oh, Always. Yeah. I was doing numbers and all that, right? Excuse you know, me? Betting. On, like they had numbers again. Oh, they, the numbers was big enough uh, up in Harlem. Anyway, so let me get to the, the funny part of the story. So, so uh, this girl approaches the car. This, this black girl approaches the car, and uh, she sees us there. And uh, she, what do you say, boys? Uh, uh, you want to have some fun? <laughs> so one of the guys says, oh, wait a minute, we're looking for a Spanish girl. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute. Now, she's as black as the ace of spades. She says, man, I'm Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> this is the funny part. Uh, so, uh... So, uh... I don't recall. I, 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 I think we struck out that night. <laughs> we went, went back home. <laughs> we went back home. And uh, but I had, I had to tell you that because it was very, very funny. <laughs> it's, it's obvious, you know, she was, uh, she was really a black, a black girl. <laughs> but man, us <I'm> Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. Boys who first joined the service. Should we? Actually, were after girls? No. No, 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 no. Let's go for a. Uh... Service. What happened? So you were. Well, how, how old then? How old was I then? Yeah, that was like 17, 18 years old, right? 17, 18. And then 
when did the war start and the service and all that? Oh, well, the what? war started, obviously, uh, the, we went into the service. Uh, 18? Oh, did you we go, went did you 1941. Did you go to the service because of the war? Or yes. did you join before the war? I didn't join. You were drafted? drafted. I, was in, I was inducted. Inducted. Yeah. Inducted. You know what inducted means? No, I didn't know what inducted That means Uncle Sam wants you. Oh, I thought that was come, we want you. And if you don't come, we're going to come and get you. Like that's what, that's what I thought draft, it would be. Right? Mm -hmm. A draft. Yeah. Kind of like a draft. Anyway, so uh, I was 22 at the time when I was inducted. Oh, so well, we we're missing some time period here. So, 17, 18 to 22, what were you doing? Well, like I say, I had a lot of jobs school? here and there. Like? I worked... Uh, oh, yeah, let's hear the jobs. I worked at various different jobs. Uh, one job, a part-time job I had. Uh... When I was working at the school, I worked for a dental mechanic, what they call a dental laboratory, where they make false teeth mm -hmm. for different dentists. I worked for a, a, a guy by the name of Irving Berlin, but he's not the he's not the songwriter that you may have heard. Never heard. Never, never, heard. never heard of Irving Berlin? No. Nope. That was way before your time. <laughs> way before your time. Anyway. I worked part-time at the school, del making deliveries. I got $4 a week, plus the car fare that uh, it, it's required, delivering uh, dental plates and stuff like that, and also learning. Uh, they were trying to teach me to trade there at the uh, dental lab. Sammy, what's, bug what's bugging you? Take my shoe off. Anyway, so uh, that was one of the jobs I had. And uh, let's see, had a lot of different jobs, odds and end jobs that they were. Let's, let's see now. None of them were very interesting, really. I worked in a, I worked for a stationery store on Canal Street in New York for a while. Do you remember the name of it or the the block it was on? Canal Street. Canal Street. Canal Street. Canal Street. Oh, I don't remember. It's on sort of uh, sort of on the west side of Canal Street, way further down. Did you finish high school? Uh, there goes a very interesting question. There we go. A very interesting question, and I have to be honest about it. Okay? Yeah. I have to be honest about it. Of course. It. And I don't want anything that I say. Uh, to be used against you in the court of law? Or, no, no I, I don't want it to influence you in any way because I have made a mistake. And to this day I'm suffering for it and I'm sorry about it. But I will try to tell you why. I had quit high school after the second, second term. Second and I was, grade, in 10th grade? Excuse me? In 10th grade or in the 9th grade? Oh, well, you'd call that the 10th grade. All right. Second term. 10th grade, I guess you'd call it. I'm thinking term. And uh, all right, now I could qualify that by telling you this. I'm not trying to blame anybody for it because I have myself to blame. But I try to qualify this in this respect that I grew up not having any guidance. I had no father to tell me that I could do it or I can't do it. I had a mother, of course, but my mother, God bless her, let's see, she's a, rest in peace, was a, an ignorant woman who had no schooling whatsoever. Never went to school. She couldn't read, she couldn't write. She was a wonderful mother. But she didn't know enough to give us guidance. When I say us, I'm talking about myself, uh, Dave, and uh, Lena. And it was like like a ship going along without a rudder. Without a rudder, the ship is going to go in circles. There's no guidance. That has no doesn't know where to go unless you guide it. It's the same thing with a child. 
there's no guidance. The child goes astray. Now, when I say astray, I didn't mean it. I didn't go bad. I never, I never went bad. I was always a good kid. But uh, the fact that I, the fact that I quit high school. was, was uh, something I'll never forget. And I'm very sorry about it. To this day, I mean, here I am, 80 years old, okay? And to this day, I kick myself in the ass. <laughs> But I'm finishing school and going on to college. Uh, so I can't stress the importance enough to go on for an education, no matter how hard it may be for you. No matter how many hardships you may endure, no matter how you have to suffer doing it. You, you gotta go on, you gotta do it. Because if you don't, for the rest of your life you'll be sorry. Now, let me say, I'm not a stupid person, I'm not, I'm not, I can't say I'm not educated, but any education I have, I, I am self-educated self-taught, but it's not enough. You need the form. Excuse me, it's very hot. What is an F now? You need a formal education is what I'm trying to get out. Mm -hmm. okay. That's very, very important. You must have a formal education. Now let's get on. Alright. What do you want to discuss next? Well, we want to talk about when you join the service, the war. All right, you know, that's an area I never spoke about in, in great length. Because it's been a sore spot for me. Well, as far as as, as far as, uh, giving you the preliminaries are concerned, so I was drafted into the service and I went through the normal course of, uh, 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 what do you call that when you're... Boot camp? Basic training. A boot camp, you call it today? Well, it was a form of boot camp. I went through that and I took various different tests and uh, as a result of the test that I took, I was... Uh, they put me in the Air Force, which was considered good, you know, the mm -hmm. fact that uh, you had to have a pretty high intelligence quota mm -hmm. before you were accepted for that. And uh, so I went for various different schools, and uh, as a result of that, I became a flight engineer in the Air Force. I went to gunnery school, I went to airplane mechanic school, I went to, oh, for about a year and a half I went to schools. Did nothing but go to schools. And then, of course, I was, uh, I became part of a crew, a flight crew, and uh, went overseas and uh, flew B-17s. What was the name of your crew? The name of my crew? Well, my crew didn't have any particular name. <laughs> did you name, you name yourself? Crew. Oh, did you find a Mustang? That's a question I had. Is that what? A Mustang is a fighter plane. You, you, you didn't fly that? No, I didn't fly a Mustang. Okay. A Mustang was a single engine, a single seater. Uh -huh. It was a fighter plane. Oh, okay. What, it was you, only for the pilot. B-17 you flew? I flew B-17, which, which, was, a, which was considered a large bomber in those days that a crew of 10 men. And like I say, I was the flight engineer on the crew. 
the flight engineer was the highest ranking non-com on the crew, other than the officers that the pilot, co-pilot, the bombardier navigator. So I was next in the... Anyway, so uh, uh, that's not important now. Uh, so we f at the time I flew, I flew uh, out of England, with the, I was with the 8th Air Force, and uh, they was, the Germans were knocking us out of the sky left and right. I mean, they were knocking us out left and right. Uh, so much so, if you flew 25 missions, they figured that your luck ran out. That's it, you're not going to have any more luck. Your luck ran out. You flew 25 missions, and you, you were able to go home. And it was a rarity for any crew to make 25 missions. Fact of the matter is, I was shot down on my fourth mission. I was shot down. Actually, the third and fourth mission. But on the third mission, we were able to make it back to England, and we crash-landed, did a belly landing in the sheep pasture in England. And luckily, nobody got seriously hurt except the uh, bombardier. He uh, hurt his back pretty bad. Anyway, so uh, on our fourth mission, you want to get a tape? Hmm? No, I don't think so. I've got plenty of tape. Left. So on our fourth mission... Were you scared to go back on the fourth mission after the crash? You know, it's a peculiar thing. You stay scared. You knew the danger was there. But like any young fella, any young kid, and I say young kid, even at 22, you're a young kid. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, you're not an adult yet. Until you mature. You figure it's, it's going to happen. Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen to the next guy. It's not going to happen to you. I mean, you know, I'm, you're impervious to all that sort of thing. It's going to happen to the next guy. So, uh, unfortunately, it happened to me too. <laughs> On a fourth mission, we were shot down. And we crash landed in Germany. That's the second crash landing that we made. That we survived. <laughs> Not good. And you had to, uh, what happened there? You well, that's what happened since the moment of the landing. You got shot in the leg, I remember you telling me. Yeah, well, uh, I got shot in the leg. I got a machine gun bullet in my uh, thigh. And it was with me for the duration of the time I was a prisoner of war. For how long? Machine. Well, I was prisoner of war for 16 months, and that bullet wasn't taken out for uh, two years afterward. Must have been hard to get out, huh? And it was taken out by a private doctor that I went to. Not a lot of grizzle, right? Yeah? Grizzle in there? Yeah, yeah you know the story, right? Tell me about that. I told you that story. What's well, so, <laughs> You know the story? How did, how did you get to the camp? Yeah, well, tell us from when you cracked. You, you had to bury your dog where, tags, right? Where did you crash? Yeah, because you were Jew in Germany at the time, right. so what would you do? Christ was in Germany. Like, heard, in Germany heard, proper. I heard you landed in a, in a mountain, somewhere in the mountains. Not a mountain. Where did you crash land? We landed, crash landed in, a, in Germany about five miles from the uh, Holland border. The exact location, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were picked up immediately. The whole crew was picked up. At the time, like I said, had a machine gun bullet in my leg. I was bleeding profu profusely. And uh, uh, the flying suit I had on was soaking wet with blood. But at, at the time of uh, all this took place, in the heat of the action, in the heat of the, th the throw of the action, you didn't really feel the... the being shot it just felt like uh, something cold in the lake. Hmm. Something cold. But you didn't know, I didn't know it was shot until afterwards. Anyway, so when, when we did crash land, finally, we were followed down. Well, well, let me give you the particulars how we crash land and why we crash landed. We went over target, dropped our bombs. Dropped our bombs on target. And uh, the flak was coming up. You know what flak is? Anti-aircraft. Yeah. Big bursts of bursts of black smoke, which was anti-aircraft fire. Yeah. 
Like but it's more than smoke. There's a lot of shrapnel yeah. involved there. So we got hit, and it knocked out two engines. We had a four-engine airplane. Two engines of ours were knocked out. And as a result of the engines being knocked out, we couldn't keep up with formation. And once you're out of, once you're out of formation, you're a shooting duck, you know, mm -hmm. because the uh, German fighters can pick you off. You're no match for a, for a fighter, fighter plane. Mm -hmm. So we got hit by fighters. Luckily, fortunately, well, luckily, I have to shoot down one a German fighter. This one? An ME 109. Hey, one is enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just one. I shot that an ME 109. But then, of course, they got us and they, they shot us down. And uh, uh, what we try to do was, we try to hit the deck. Hitting the deck means flying treetop level. And if you're flying treetop level, you you, you, uh, a, a fighter can't get you simply because they can't dive under you mm. and they can't dive away because it restricts their motion. But uh, they got a week, uh, we, we couldn't we couldn't fly at all because we were out of power, lost power completely. So we crash landed. And it was through the uh, the fact that our co pilot was the one that kept his head was the fact was why we're alive today. He was able to keep his head and he he kept us in a uh, a safe landing pattern. We landed, and we chopping down trees as we were going. Our wings were really chopping down trees, landing in the forest. Mm -hmm. Trees all around. It was on a belly, you know, with no wheels or anything on the belly. Finally, we came to came came to a stop, which was really, really uh, unbelievable because, but it was because of the. Uh, our co-pilot, who was very, very, uh, a very, very good pilot, he got us down safely. Well, at that point, you know, when the plane came to a stop, the safest thing to do is get the hell away from the airplane because it could go on fire and explode. Plus, you know, because the Germans can see the airplane a lot better than they can see you. So when we opened up the cockpit, the cockpit window. And I, we, uh, my pilot, co-pilot, jumped out of one side. He jumped out. I followed my pilot out of the uh, of the cockpit window, and it was quite a drop from the cockpit to the ground. It's quite a drop. It's got to be a good uh, twelve to fifteen feet from the cockpit to the ground, and that's on it with a belly landing. If it was on wheels, it would be much higher than that. So, uh, jumped out the window, hit the ground on one leg, and uh, I was wearing dog tags. Now, every GI has issued dog tags, and on your dog tags, you have a, uh, a symbol showing whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Hebrew. And of course, I had an H on mine, being a Hebrew, Jewish, Hebrew. Were there any other Hebrews in yeah. Out here. Then, uh, were there any other Hebrew Jewish guys in your plane? Uh, My crew? No, yeah. I was the only one. I was the only one. I was afraid of what might happen should I, I should, that I should be singled out being a Jew because of Hitler, the Nazis and stuff. Oh, yeah. So I thought it would be safer and quicker for me and safer for me to discard my dog tags. And I took my dog tags off and I dug them into the ground, dug them into the dirt, earth, and I buried it in the ground, which was a mistake because uh, later on I was threatened to be a spy because I had no dog tags. And being a, a civilian, you're a spy. No dog tags, you're not in the service, right? Well, that's another story. Well, keep going with that one. Well, you know, quite frankly, fellas, I'll tell you something. There is so much to tell. So much to tell. I can't possibly do it in one sitting 
by one time, really. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, well, you know, you're talking about uh, taking 80, 80 years cramming and cramming it into a matter of, of an hour or so. And it's very, very difficult to do. But I'll tell you what, let me hit the highlights, okay? I'll hit the highlights and I'll be as explicit as I can, just hitting the highlights. All right, so to do a take a prisoner, it was on the back of a truck, and we were, and we were. I was injured very badly. I lost a lot of blood, taking that machine gun bullet in my leg. Uh, they drove us down to various different places, trying to get us into a hospital. Most of the hospitals that they took us to were filled up. They couldn't take any more uh, patients. Finally, came to a hospital that was in a, a hospital that was run by by French, by the French, mm -hmm. who also who were prisoners of war, French prisoners of war, were running this hospital. And we just, they took us in there and uh, we stayed there. Uh, I stood there for, I don't remember the length of time that I stayed in the hospital. It possibly was a week or two or thereabouts. And from there they took, uh, took me on. And we all got separated, you know. Our crew got separated at the time. Uh, so we went off to different camps because of the fact that I went here and they went to other places. And I spent time in hospital and some of them didn't because some had no injuries at all, you know. Uh, well, to make a long story short, after I got out of the hospital, I was sent to a, uh, an interrogation center. Interrogation center means it's a center where they, they, uh, put you, they, they question you, give you the third degree, you know. And, uh, well, here we go, you know, I'm trying to hit the highlights. And, uh, I have and, uh, an interesting question. How did, um, what happened when um, you had to lose your toes? What happened? What's the story? Well, that's that's, 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 that's the last story. That happened when I was a POW. Oh, in the POW camp? Yeah, it happened as a POW. Oh. I was on a forced march where we were evacuating a camp that was uh, located in East Prussia, which is near Russia. When the Russians were making their advance mm -hmm. into Germany, they evacuated all the prisoners and took the prisoners out. And we were on, a, like I said, this forced march. And it was during the month of like February. In Russia, that's cold. So, and the circulation in the hand and the foot that I was hit in the leg that I was hit, it impaired the circulation to such a degree that I wasn't getting enough uh, blood. blood flow to my foot, and my foot froze. So I got uh, I got gangrene in the foot, and the foot froze. And uh, of course I'm jumping around now. You know what I mean? I'm really jumping around here. And I'm sick of you saying after you get, after you make a long story short, you got out of the the sick bay. You got out of the hospital, right? Yeah. And you say you interrogation. You well, from can... there, well, from there, I went to an interrogation center. This is a very interesting part of it here, because in an interrogation center, each individual prisoner was locked into a cell, which basically was in a small room, and no windows, no, <laughs> there was a one door that you can't get out of, of course, and no windows that you get out. And uh, uh, okay, door opens, and I'm taken by God into a office. And in this office is a German officer, impeccably dressed. You know, of course, impeccably, you know what it means. Uh -huh. You know, uh, dressed to it, dressed to their teeth. And uh, just like you see in the movies. In fact, in fact, when I saw this, I said, geez, I, I was wondering if they were making a movie out of it. <laughs> 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 Anyways, he sits me down. He says, uh, "All right." He says, "Look." He says, uh, "He's not asking me questions." He 
you know, and, and at the time when you had gone through a uh, uh, training uh, period, you were told if you take a prisoner, all you give is your name, rank, and serial number, and you offer no other information. No other information. Name, rank, and serial number. That's all you're authorized to tell the enemy. And of course, they're the enemy to me, of course. So they started asking me questions. In English, German, what were they? Excuse me? How were they talking? English, German? Oh, English. And the German, heavy German accent. Like you see in the movies, a heavy German accent. English, of course. If you talk German, I would understand. <laughs> I would understand. Well, first of all, they offered me a cigarette. And this is the funny part. They offered me a cigarette. And, uh, Did you smoke at the time? or? Then I saw I smoked like crazy at the time. <laughs> and I haven't had a cigarette since I was shot down. Well, since, wow. And those smokes. So you definitely so, took that, huh? Anyway, I saw that cigarette. So uh, he says that. Uh, me a he said, you know, these are American cigarettes. So I said, uh, oh, West Point, eh? I never heard of that brand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never heard of that brand. Well, he said, they're American cigarettes. <laughs> 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 so he started asking me questions. I said, I'm sorry, sir, but all I'm authorized to do is give you my name, rank, and serial number. And if you wish to have that, I will be, I will be much obliged to give it to you. He said, look, I want to ask you some questions, he says, and I want answers. Don't give me that stuff with name, rank, and serve. I want answers. And they start asking me questions about my company commander, what's his name? I said, I'm sorry, all I can tell you, sir, is my name, rank, and serial number. He says, look, he says, I'm going to ask you again. What was your company commander's name? And I want an answer. Again, I told him that. I'm authorized to tell you name, rank, and serial number. And that's all I can tell you. He said to me, look, he says, I've had colonels come in. I've had majors. I've had colonels that I interrogated. And I got information out of them. You're a stinking sergeant. What are you telling me about name, rank, and serial number. He says, do you know? He says, I can have you shot as a spy. You don't even have dog tags, which is true. They don't even have dog tags. But I tell you, I must have been awfully stupid. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, sir. All I can tell you is <laughs> name, rank, and serial Well, I want to tell you something. He got infuriated. He was literally livered. He says, you know what he says? I'm going to have you shot as a And before I have you shot as a spy, he says, I'm going to tell you something. He says, he told me my commander's name. He yeah. says, I'll even tell you the, the woman who he's sleeping with in town. Oh, wow. Of course, he could have been bullshit me. I didn't know the woman he was sleeping with. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so he knew more about my outfit than I knew. God's honest truth. He knew my squadron. He knew my cover. The, the group that I was flying out of. He knew my squadron number. He knew he knew uh, the kids on my crew. Wow. He was a little snitch. Wait a minute. And here again, I said, I'm sorry, sir. All I can tell you is my name. You you might be right. You might be wrong. I can tell you my name, rank, and serial number. That's as far as I can go. He got to live it again. He says, he picked up the telephone and he called for the guard to take me out. And on the way out, he says, you are a dead man. You're going to be shot. You're going to be shot tomorrow morning. Oh, my God. I said to myself, I'm dead. I am dead. God takes me out, takes me back to my cell, throws me in a room. I said, well, that's it. I'm going to be dead tomorrow. That's it. We're uh, nervous. We're scary. Life, we're like my life is over. I just took it as a matter of fact. This is it. Comes the next morning. Door opens for my cell. And I look down the hall. You didn't sleep? And I see... I, I, don't, I don't know if I slept or not. I don't even remember. But I look down the hall. And all the other doors from all of the other cells open too. The guys are coming out just like I'm coming out. 
I don't know if the, all these guys are going to be in shot the same I'm going to, the same, I'm going to be shot or what. But they line us all up, they march us out, and the P.S. I didn't get shot. Wow. <laughs> Here I am to the yes. uh, Well, from there they sent us to uh, uh, the first camp, the first prisoner of war camp, which was incidentally in East Prussia. You know what East Prussia is? Do you ever hear of the Baltic states? The Baltic states? I'll there's give no, you a, there's give no you a little geography or... lesson and history lesson here. The Baltic states are Estonia, Lithuania. Have you heard of yeah, these countries? Lithuania, yeah, yeah. Lithuania, Estonia, and uh, what was the third one? Yugoslavia. I forget the third one. Anyway, those are the Baltic states. And that's where the camp was located, which is not far from Russia. Now, how'd they get us there? On boxcars. Uh. They jammed us into boxcars. And I literally mean jammed us in. There was hardly any place to sit. And this was a long haul from central Germany. Frankfurt on the Main is where the interrogation center was. And that's in central Germany. And we traveled and traveled and traveled in the boxcars. I don't know how long it took us, but it like seemed like forever that we did, traveled. Did the sun set and rise, or wasn't that long? Did I? Did the, the sun, sun set and rise, or? Uh... You know, I tell you quite frankly, a lot of stuff in my mind is vague, because uh, I, I can't remember all the details or all the ramifications involved in the internment. But uh, all I know is a long, long haul, and it was many, many, many miles. And uh, it's fun. That's a good question with the sun stars. It could have been an overnight thing, now that you mention it. And we did have certain stops where we could take a leak, to get off and take a leak, but we were on, on the guard machine guns all around us, you know. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, we went a long time without food. We made one stop where we had some hot Nescafe. Did you ever hear Nescafe? Instant coffee? Mm -hmm. That's good. Nescafe. It was the instant coffee that we had. Where they got it, I don't know, but we had some coffee. And God, boy, that was good. <laughs> oh, was that good, that coffee. <laughs> but then we traveled some more and some more and some more. And we traveled. We finally got to our destination. And uh, how far the camp was from the railroad, here again, I don't remember that. But we finally got into camp, in a, in a camp. And we were assigned to certain bunks. They were like, uh, oh. See, you guys ever see Stalag 17? No. You never saw it? the movie Stalag 17? Didn't he tell us to see it last time? Never no, saw it. I, don't, no. No. I think I told you this. Yeah, Woodstock. You told yeah. me that. Well, see if you can take it and rent it uh, in a video store. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they got it. Maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, it was a very popular movie. Uh, Anyway, it was very much like that, the, the camps. We had a coal burning, a coal burning stove in the center of the barracks. You know what an army barracks looks like? Mm -hmm. Pretty much like an army barracks. And uh, we signed to certain bunks, and uh, we got to bunks. And uh, being uh, being a non-commissioned officers, we weren't required to work, as enlisted men were, because there was uh, with the camp that we went to was called Stalag Luft. Luft means air, air personnel, fly personnel. And uh, big fly personnel, fly personnel, they took extra, put on extra guards, extra machine gun towers, because they kept us under careful surveillance. Because if we escaped, we were a very valuable commodity. Being a trained per flying personnel, we were a valuable commodity to the uh, to, to the American uh, forces. forces. Anyway, so a few guys tried to escape, and a few guys got killed in the attempt trying to escape. That's why we were in camp. Uh, 
I can't speak of any eventful things happening in camp other than uh, we were in camp on the lock and key and uh, the food was less, less than less than horrible. I mean, dried cabbage soup with worms and maggots. Yeah. And the only salvation we had that after a while, we were able to get Red Cross parcels. And in the Red Cross parcels, they had some goodies, you know, had some cigarettes, which was great because cigarettes was like money, you know, in the camp. Cigarettes mm -hmm. was money. That Cur was it. Currency. Uh, as the uh, rate of exchange with cigarettes. Hmm. You know, and the Red Cross parcels had her a piece of concentrated chocolate that had a, like a can of Spam and it had powdered milk and they had uh, other items, you know, high density foods, high density foods uh, that were able to s sustain you for a while. So you could supplement the German rations that you got, which was indeed very, very nice to have at the time. Uh, Any matches? Excuse me. Matches for the oh, cigarettes. Matches? Yeah, yeah, matches for cigarettes. Oh, no, wait a minute. Matches? No, but there were lots. Some guys had lighters, oh. cigarette lighters. Did they charge you a cigarette to light their cigarettes? Or? What? Did they, charge, did they charge you a cigarette in order to light your cigarette? No. Uh, oh, they weren't stingy? Uh, where'd well, you get that idea? Well, I just figured if I had a lighter, and I was in a camp, and I'm the only guy with a lighter, I'd charge people a yeah. cigarette for me to light their... And maybe you wouldn't wake up in the morning either, <laughs> and you wouldn't have the lighter anymore. <laughs> How would you like that? Uh, Were the camps abusive, did the, uh, the German soldiers? No, you see, what they had, the, the guards in the camp were older guys, that they couldn't send to the front. Uh -huh. They weren't uh, young, vibrant soldiers. They were older men, so to speak, you know. And, uh, you know, they just took their, as a matter of, they took their job as mm -hmm. a job, you know. They did their thing, you know, and, uh, and uh, we used to fool around with them too, you know. <laughs> when we see,